particularly living like God right at the moment. You ever meet anybody that's not living like God at the moment? <laughs> well, it's changed my view of that as well, to where as I look at them, I see them differently than what I used to. And, and this, th let's just read a couple of verses here, because I, I, it's really important. Uh, Luke 15, starting verse 1, says, Then all the tax collectors, now we all know the tax collectors, nobody likes the tax collectors. And in those days... The tax collectors were almost more like the mafia. They were basically Jewish people that had sold out to the Roman government to take taxes from other Jewish people. And they weren't just taking taxes, they were, they were actually adding on more taxes to line their own pockets. And everybody knew it, but they couldn't do anything about it, so the tax collectors were highly hated. In fact, they said that most tax collectors had bruised shins all the time because if you walk by one, you kicked them and you spit on them. Nobody liked the tax collectors. And yet it says right here, then all the tax collectors and the sinners. That's a pretty big group of people right there. All the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to Jesus. Wow. You would think all the religious people would have been, oh, yeah, here he is. No, it was the tax collectors and the sinners that were drawing near to Jesus. <laughs> Amen. They were the ones that saw life. They were the ones that saw help. They were the ones that saw that, that this, is, this is a good God here. They saw something different that they wanted. And they said, this, this can change my life. So those were the people that drew near to him. And in verse 2, it goes on to say, And the Pharisees and the scribes, those were the guys that should have known who Jesus was. Those were the guys that read their Bible every day. Those were the guys that prayed every day. Those were the guys that tried to do everything exactly right. Right? These were the, most, these were the religious of the religious people. It says, But the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. He doesn't just tolerate them. He eats with them. And in, in Jesus' day, when you ate with somebody, it was a covenant act. It says, I am aligning myself with you. Wow. Jesus, the Son of God from heaven is down here on earth and he comes up to the worst of the worst and he says you know what i love you and i'm aligning myself with you not with what your actions are but with you who i created you to be who i intended you to be from the beginning of all things from before the foundations of the earth i know who i created you to be and i'm aligning myself with you now, you might look a little rough on the outside here, but what you are on the inside, I know what that is. And I'm aligning myself with you. And that the Pharisees and the, the, the uh, scribes were complaining about him. They said that he eats with sinners. And so, he, speaking of Jesus, spoke this parable to them, saying... What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 just persons who need no repentance at all. What an incredible story here. What a, you know, and, and, and we, th we see this and we, we have this kind of picturesque view of this. You know, of this, we, we see all the pains of Jesus with the sheep on his shoulders. And we think, oh, how lovely. But I want to I just go into this just a little bit. Do you realize when Jesus did this, he's talking to the Pharisees and the scribes. And 
We think it's a nice little story, but what he's doing is he is condemning the scribes and the Pharisees very harshly in this moment. So I want us to open up to Ezekiel for just a second. Ezekiel. Because Jesus just isn't telling a story out of nothing. He isn't just coming up with this out of the blue. He says, I only speak what I hear the Father say. I only do what, I, uh, what I've seen the Father do. Right? So the Father is speaking this out. Do you realize that the Father has been saying this over and over and over again throughout the whole history of mankind? We just didn't hear it. We just didn't hear it. So in Ezekiel chapter 34, when he says, when he talks about the shepherd going after the sheep, right? He is speaking directly to the Pharisees. The Pharisees should have been the shepherds. They should have been the one that was watching over the flock. They should have been the one that was taking care of the people. They should have been the one that was binding up the brokenhearted, binding up those who are, were hurt, binding up those who have had problems. And isn't that what Jesus said in, in, in Luke um, 418, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. He has given me the power. He has given me the ability. He has given me everything that I need to do these things. He has anointed me to preach the gospel, to proclaim the good news. Now, how many of you know in some churches, they're not preaching good news. They're preaching sin and you're a dirty, rotten scoundrel. And when you go home, you're a little beat up. That's not what Jesus preached. He preached the good news. He's anointed to preach the good news. Amen? To preach the gospel to the poor. Well, what's good news to the poor? You don't have to be poor anymore. Right? Uh, uh, to, to, um, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. How many people in the world are brokenhearted right now and the church is doing nothing to heal the brokenhearted? Do you realize Jesus now lives in you? So as Jesus is reading this, this is something you can speak over yourself. The Spirit of the Lord is upon you because He's anointed you to, pro, uh, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive, to recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And the acceptable year of the Lord was the year in which all debts were forgiven. Now, wouldn't you like to have that here in the United States? At the end of, at the end of so many years, it doesn't matter how big of a debt you've got, it's forgiven. And you start with a clean slate with all the promises of God given back to you and you can start again brand new. Wow. This is what Jesus came to do. Now the people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were acting like they were the shepherd of the people. They were acting like those were the ones that were taking care of the people. And yet this, this is what uh, uh, the, the prophet Ezekiel has to say. Uh, in start, uh, chapter 34, starting in verse uh, Verse 1, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds. So this is, it's not sounding good for the shepherds right here, just telling you. When God says prophesy against, everything that comes after that's not good for whoever he's talking to. Prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God to the shepherds. Woe to the shepherds. Now when God throws in a woe, that just kind of, it, it, it doubles it up right there. He's saying, you know, he's prophesying against them and then he say, says woe to them. This, this is not good. Say, woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. How many have ever known somebody that's feeding themselves instead of feeding the sheep? Who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? And yet the shepherds, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, they were feeding themselves, they were getting rich, they were getting uh, comfortable, but they were putting great burdens on the people. Burdens that they were not doing themselves, and yet they were placing them on the people, and the people weren't able to bear them. 
Whoa, uh, they should be feeding the flock. Verse 3, you eat the fat and the choice, uh, uh, you feed, yeah, blah, blah, blah. You eat, uh, you eat the fat and clothe yourself with the wool and slaughter and, uh, the fatlings, but you do not feed my flock. In other words, you're out there, you're abusing the, 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 the flock. You're using their wool for your clothes, making nice, fine threads, and you're, 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 you're killing them, and you're eating them, and, and, and you're the one that's supposed to be taking care of them. Right? How many people have come out of a place where they're hurt, where they're, they're, they're in pain, where their shepherd is doing this to them, right? Uh, but you, you do not feed them. Verse 4, the weak you have not strengthened. Do you know Jesus came for the weak? Jesus came for those who could not help themselves. Jesus came to minister life and godliness. It says he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. This is Jesus in our lives. This is who he is. He is the good shepherd. Now he's condemning these bad shepherds here, but Jesus is the good shepherd. Amen? Amen. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick. Oh, my word. These are all the things that he wants to do. He wants to strengthen the weak. He wants to heal the sick. Um, nor have you bound up the broken, nor bought back what was driven away. How many times do sheep leave the church? And the shepherd goes, adios, don't let the door hit you in the keister on the way out, right? No, the shepherd goes after the sheep. The shepherd loves the sheep. The shepherd cares about the sheep. And yet, that was not what was happening in Jesus' day. He saw that the sheep were scattering because no one was taking care of them. No one was loving them. No one was watching over them. No one was feeding them. You've not healed them up. You've not uh, strengthened those who were sick. You've not bound up the broken or brought back that which was driven away, nor sought what was lost. And what did we just read about in Luke 15? The lost sheep. You've not sought what was lost. He, Jesus went about seeking the lost. You know, we were all lost. And this word lost is an incredible thing right here. The word lost I've never lost a ballpoint pen. I've misplaced a bunch of them, but I just grab another one. It has little value. You know, you can buy a whole box of them for just, you know, pennies, right? And, and so I've never lost a ballpoint pen. I've, I've misplaced them, and then I find them again. But now, when you've lost something, that's a thing of value. You haven't lost, if you lose something, it's something you're going to search out. I know in our house when my wife has set her ring down somewhere and then she can't find it, we tear the whole house apart looking for the ring. Why? Because not only has it got some value monetarily, but it's got sentimental value. It's got personal value. It's lost and we need to find it. If your child went missing... You wouldn't just say, oh, you know, well, you know, your little three-year-old's out there running around somewhere, and you're, you're like, oh, well, you know, when they get hungry, they'll come home. No, when you can't find your three-year-old, you go out looking for them. They're lost. Lost indicates something that has great value and great worth that you are not going to live without. You are going to seek it out. It's so so it, when it says you have not sought for the lost, But with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So they were uh, scattered. And because there was no shepherd. And they became food for the beasts of the field. They were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains. And on the high places. On the high hills. Yes my flock was scattered. Over the whole face of the earth. And no one was seeking or searching for them. He goes on. He continues to condemn them a little bit more. But let's look at verse 11 here. 
Let's look at verse 11. For thus says the Lord God, Indeed, I myself will search for my sheep. I will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy day and on a dark day. I will bring them up from the peoples. I will gather them from the countries. I will bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, in the valleys and in the inhabitable places out of the country. I will feed them in the good pastures and uh, their... their um, Fold shall not be on the high mountains of Israel. Therefore, they shall lie down in good fold and feed in rich pastures on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock. I will make them to lie down, says the Lord. I will seek what was lost and bring back what was driven away. And... Um, Bind up the broken and strengthen what is sick. I will destroy the fat. Uh, uh, I, I will destroy the fat and strong and feed them in judgment. Speaking of the false shepherds. So what is he saying? He's saying, I'm going to be the shepherd. You guys blew it. I'm going to be the shepherd. And that's what was happening in Luke 15. And Luke 15, he was talking about what the good shepherd. He was talking about the shepherd that went out and he sought out the sheep. And I love this right here. It says, uh, it says uh, one man having one sheep, uh, they've left the 99 in the wilderness to go after the one which he lost until... He finds it. Where's the end of that? Until he finds it. He's not giving up. Do you realize that God does not give up? You know, we sometimes, we get involved in something and we go a little ways and it gets rough and it's tired and it's whatever and we give up, right? Or we slow down. At a, at a minimum, sometimes we're just kind of we're just kind of barely moving along, but we're, we're, our heart's not. He says, until he finds it. He's the good shepherd. He does not give up until he finds the lost sheep. Hallelujah. He does not give up until he finds you. And then when he finds you, what does it say he does? It, sa it doesn't say that he comes up and he goes, all right. Now, listen up, sheep. I'm going to head back to camp, and if you're a smart sheep, you're going to follow me. And if not, you're on your own. No, what does he do? He picks you up. He puts you on his back. He bears the weight of you on his shoulders. Hallelujah. He's a good shepherd. And you know what? There is, okay, this, is a, this is an intimate thing right here. He's got the lamb laying over his shoulder. So his, the shepherd's face is right here. The lamb's face is right here. And he's talking to him. He's saying, oh, lamb, I'm so glad I found you. Lamb, I love you so much. Oh, I'm so glad I found you before some harm came to you. You know, and, and, and when he found that lamb, you know that he picked him up and he's looking him over and making sure that he's healed, he's whole, he's well, he's not scratched up, that no animals got to him, that, that, not, that he doesn't have a broken leg or anything. He's taking care of him. He did not stop until he found him because he loves him. Amen? Amen. And, and so then when he gets home, I love this fact. When he comes home, he calls together his friends, his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you likewise, there will be more joy in heaven. He's rejoicing. Do you realize God has great joy in you? 
great joy in you. He rejoices over you. He sings over you songs of deliverance. He expresses his love continually for you. He doesn't sneak the sheep in by dark of night and say, okay, we're going to pretend like you never left and we're just, going to, we're just going to turn a blind eye to all that stuff you did. No, he brings you in and he says, I love you. I love you. you. You realize that Luke 15 has got three parables here. And, and, and the, um, the, the third one is the parable of the lost son. The parable of the lost son. And when the parable of the lost son, it says that, you know, he took the money and he went in the far country and he spent all the money and, and, and now he's destitute and now he's living with pigs. Right? Pigs. Gross pigs. Stinky pigs that are out in the field, and he's living out in the field with the pigs. And the little pig droppings, that's where he's laying, with the pigs. I want you to get the big picture here. It's nasty. It's gross. And as he's laying there one night, he remembers his father. And he says, you know, even my father's hired servants have more than enough. And it says, and he came to himself. Now, when he came to himself, he didn't have this great revelation. Oh, God is is perfect, and and, and this isn't who I am. All he saw was the best he could do when he came to himself. You know, sometimes we come to ourselves and we look at what we can do. The best he could see himself doing was becoming a slave. He said, I'm going to go back, return to the Father, and I'm going to say, I've sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called a son, but if you would make me a hired servant, a day laborer, a guy that comes, and when you need extra help, you hire me, and and you, you pay me a little bit, and I know that you feed me, and you'll take care of me in that moment. That's the best he could see. That was when he came to himself. But when he gets to his father, I love this. The father runs and hugs and kisses and loves on him and doesn't stop hugging him and kissing him. And the son tries to go into his little spiel about how unworthy he is and how horrible he is. And the father just keeps on lavishing love on him. And you know what the father does? The father never brings up his past. He doesn't say, well, what did you do out there? He doesn't say, well, I know you did this or that or the other. He doesn't talk about his past at all. What does he do? He starts reminding him of who he is. He says, go get the best coat and put it on him. Well, who had the best coat in the house? The father did. And in those days, coats represented identity because everybody had a different coat because it was made specifically for them. You know, when we see uh, uh, all the people stoning Stephen and it says they laid their coats at the feet of Paul, what were they saying? They're saying, I'm giving myself to you, Paul, and your desires and your will and your desire and will is to stone Stephen. So they were giving themselves to Stephen to stone Stephen. Uh, they're giving themselves to, 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 to Saul to sow Stephen. Well, the father says, I want to wrap you. You've forgotten who you are. You've forgotten who you came from. You've forgotten your identity. And your identity, you were, it says, I created you in my image and in my likeness. Do you realize you're created in the image of God and in the likeness of God? That's an incredible thought. Can you write, really wrap your brain around that? I'm glad I'm growing more and more in that every day. I'm in his image and in his likeness, and so are you. The Father's saying, you've been looking at all this outward stuff. I want to surround you with my identity to remind you, you are my son. You come forth from me. You're of my lineage. You're of my likeness. You're of my kind, and I want you to remember that. When everybody looks at you now, they're going to know, oh, He's the Father's Son. He isn't just some bum trying to beg money. He's the Father's Son. And when you look at yourself, you should see yourself wrapped in the Father's coat. And everybody says, He's 
The Father's Son. Hallelujah. And so he gives him identity back. The second thing he does is he says, put a ring on his finger. Ring was a signet ring that represented authority, when he, which meant he could go into town and he, he'd say, all right, I want to buy this and this and this. And they go, well, what makes you think you can do that? And all he's got to do is show the ring. I've got the power and the authority to be about my father's business. The father never cut him out. The father never excommunicated him. The father never sent him away. The father says, I still want you to be a part of everything that I'm doing. Do you realize God wants you to be a part of what he's doing in the earth today? This isn't a demand that you have to make this happen. This is you get to be a part of what God's doing. What God's doing is pretty cool. Right? He's healing people. He's setting people free. He's, he's, he's loving on people. And you get to be a part of it. So he says, put a ring on his finger and remind, what was he doing? Remember, we talked about the word remember. He's reminding him. He is planting the seed back inside of him that says, this is who you are. You've forgotten. You've left it in the past. You squandered it all away. But I'm reminding you who you are in this very moment. He didn't bring up his past. He brought up his present and his future. Amen? Right now, this is who you are. And this is who you will continue to be because I am your father and I love you. The next thing he says, he says, put some sandals on his feet. Put some sandals on his feet. Slaves walked in the dirt, but sons walked on top. Hallelujah. You're a son. You're a son of the Most High God. You are a child of God Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And we've lost sight of that. And we look at that as something uh, far off in distance. Or maybe when we get to heaven and we're walking on streets of gold, then, maybe then. No, right now, you are His Son. And He wants you to walk above the dirt and the filth of this world and say, I am an overcomer. I am victorious. I am able. To, I'm above and not beneath. I'm the head, not the tail. I am victorious over all the situations and circumstances of life. Amen? This is who you are. This is what the Father is trying to put into the Son. He is not pointing out his sins, his faults, his failures, his shortcomings. He is reminding him of who he is, what his now is. Right now, everybody say right now. Right now, I am the, a child of the Most High. Amen. Right now you are. Not when you do enough good works. Not when, you've, not when you've got your whole life squared away. Not when you've uh, uh, prayed enough or read enough. Right now, you are a child of the Most High God. And He is wanting to remind you of these wonderful things. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And it's the last thing He says, Go kill the fatted calf because we're going to celebrate. We're going to have a party. We're going to celebrate that you were lost and now you're found. That you were forgot who you were. That you squandered all that I have given you. But now you've come back and now you're able to participate in all that I have. Wow. Can you imagine participating in all that God has? Can you imagine participating in 10%? Of what God has. Right? I mean, I, mean I, I still can't quite wrap my brain around participating in all His power, all of His authority, all of His will, all of His desire for my life. Oh my word, that's huge. So when He does, the, 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 when He takes the calf and, and he, says, he says, go slaughter the calf. What is He saying? He, said, he wanted to remind the Son, I want you to know we are in covenant with one another. There's nothing ever going to break that covenant. You know, uh, we understand contract, right? Contract is if you do this, 
then I will do that. And that's the way we look at God too many times. We have a contract with God. All right, God, I'm going to read my Bible, I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to go out and hand out tracts, or I'm going to do whatever good works I'm supposed to be doing, and then you're going to do some things for me, right? And that's the way we try to work with God. God says, no, I'm in covenant with you. And covenant is this right here. In the marriage covenant, what do we do? I say, I love you, and I give myself completely and totally to you. Everything that's mine is yours now. Even unto death. Gee, God was in covenant with us even unto death. But more than death, unto resurrection life. Hallelujah! Under resurrection life. He is in covenant with you unto death and then resurrection life to where now He lives inside of you. He's in covenant with you. He says, I've given you all. All. Everybody say all. all. Do you know what all means in the Greek? All. Amen. He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. And you know what? He didn't just say, I'm giving this all you. Do you remember when uh, Jonathan and David made a covenant with each other? It says they swapped instruments. Uh, not, not playing instruments, but, but to bows and swords. They swapped their their, their things of war. They swapped their coats. They swapped everything that they had. Now, you remember, David was just a, a shepherd boy, and Jonathan was a prince. And yet Jonathan says, I give you everything that I have. And David gave Jonathan everything that he had. And they were in covenant together. They said, what's mine is yours and what's yours is mine. And now we go forward and we're stronger together than what we are apart. Right? This is what God is saying to us. I am in covenant with you. And I want to remind you that because as the Father I'm in covenant with you, my son, everything that's mine is yours. Everything that's mine is yours. Man. You ought to wake up every day and say, thank you, Father, that everything that is yours has been given to me. That I'm in Christ Jesus and Jesus is in me and we've been made one together. And I, uh, uh, the other night we were talking a little bit and I, I love the word in, in, in the New Testament. It's such a powerful, it's a tiny word, in. And um, that word in means a fixed place in time or space and because it's fixed it's at rest hallelujah so when it says christ in you the hope of glory christ is in me and he's at rest in me he's not looking on how to get out he's not thinking oh my word john you really did it this time where's the where's the escape hatch and he's not trying to figure out how to get in anymore, right? He is at rest in me, which means he likes me. He's not agitated in me. You know, have you ever been in a place and you're, you're, you're kind of a little nervous being there and you're just, you're bouncing or you're pacing back and forth or you're whatever? That's, that's not Jesus. Jesus has set his home inside of you. He is in you. He is at rest in you. And because He is in us, we can begin to see our life change. We begin to see our life be conformed. It says that we were predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. Do you realize there's very few things we're predestined to do? He didn't predestine you to uh, uh, go to the darkest, deepest dark part of Africa. He didn't predestine you to do that. He did predestine you to be conformed to the image of His Son because that was His original intent from before the foundations of the world that you and Jesus would look alike. That you and Jesus would talk alike. 
that you and Jesus would act alike, that you and Jesus would be the same in everything you said and in everything you did. Hallelujah. Well, let's pray. Hallelujah. Father God, we just come to you right now, and we're just so thankful that you are a good, good Father who loves us. You are a good, good shepherd who has sought us out, and you're taking care of us as a good shepherd. You're watching over us. You're loving us. You've prepared a table for us in the midst of our enemies that we can sit down and be at rest with you, knowing that you're watching over us. You've laid us down beside still waters and in green pastures. Your rod and your staff, they, they protect us. And surely, goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives, and we will dwell in the house of the Lord. I thank you, Father God, that you are watching over each and every one of us. I pray that the eyes of our understanding be enlightened, that we would come to the realization of you, the good shepherd, and us, the sheep that you love, that you gave your life for, that you searched out and you did not stop until you found us. I pray that as we go forth from today, Father God, that that love that was poured out on from you to us, fills us to overflowing to where everybody we meet begins to see the love of God flowing out of us. Not out of force, not out of obligation, but it is the overflow of your love in our lives that begins to touch those around us. I ask that you bless us and strengthen us and watch over us. In Jesus' precious name, amen.